White. I first met Shad probably about three or four years ago when he was working for Phil Bryant, the lieutenant governor at the time. And Shad served as uh, his policy director. Shad is a, uh, he is really the embodiment of what I think the future of our country could be and, and will be, I hope, uh, if, we, uh, if we're successful doing what we're trying to do here at the Tea Party. Uh, Shad is a, a young man who's from Jones County. He's a college student presently uh, at Harvard University. And some of you know where Harvard is or have heard of Harvard. I've heard of Harvard, but I've never been on the campus. But he's, he's going to tell us a little bit about that. Uh, he is, uh, as, I, as I mentioned a moment ago, he served as the policy director for the then Lieutenant Governor Phil Bryant during the 2011 uh, legislative session when uh, a few uh, well-organized conservatives were able to successfully turn back a, uh, a liberal Democrat move for redistricting, which would have uh, really messed up and, and uh, had, had a bad effect upon the representation that we have in, in Mississippi, but they were successful. And uh, Shad played a big role in that. He uh, later served as the deputy campaign manager for Phil Bryant's uh, gubernatorial campaign. And uh, he, prior to that, he served Congressman Nunley as his uh, director uh, for policy, and uh, also led the campaign for Stacy Pickering, uh, who was from Jones County, uh, when Stacy ran, ran for state auditor. Uh, Shad is a graduate of the public schools in uh, Jones County, Mississippi, and uh, summa cum, cum laude graduate of Ole Miss. Uh, had a, has a degree in economics and political science, mm -hmm. and uh, is also a graduate of the University of Oxford in England, that's the other University of Oxford, I guess, uh, he, where he has obtained a master's in economic history. Uh, and uh, this is really interesting to me. It's, it's rare that we get to know or talk with a Rhodes Scholar, but uh, Shad is very humble about it, but he's a Rhodes Scholar. Mm -hmm. And there's only 63 of those in the country? 32 every year. 32 every year. Okay, I was wrong with that. 32. So he's one of 32 that was chosen a Rhodes Scholar. Shad is a rising star in Mississippi, and I think even nationally possibly, so he's one to keep an eye on. Um, he currently serves as president of the uh, Harvard Federalist Society, which is one of the largest chapters of a conservative libertarian uh, law group. And as I said, he's the chairman of the, uh, the uh, Federalist Society at Harvard University. So Shad's going to share his unique perspective on what it's like to be a conservative uh, young man from Mississippi who is in law school at Harvard. We know there are a few liberals up there. <laughs> yeah. How are y'all doing? Is this good? Am I in the camera shot? That's the most important thing. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Shad. Thank you, Mark, for that kind introduction. Uh, as Mark mentioned, I'm between my second and third year at Harvard Law School. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, what it's like uh, as a conservative at Harvard Law School. I'll tell you a little bit about myself in a moment and why I decided to go there and uh, why I decided to go to law school in general. But I wanted to give you uh, three stories to start to paint a picture uh, of what it's like to be a conservative at Harvard Law School. So story number one. Story number one takes place in my first year at the law school. Uh, if you've ever been to law school, you know that most law students in, in the entire country take almost the same classes for your first year. You have to take basic contracts and civil procedure and torts and that sort of thing. At Harvard Law School, we've had a noticeable change in the last couple of years. They've taken out the class called constitutional law. So apparently people at Harvard Law School think that not only do you not have to know the Constitution to be a lawyer, but you can be a lawyer without taking the class at all. Um, in place of constitutional law, they've plugged in a class called international law. And, and granted, I think, I think it's important to know the treaties that the United States has signed and the obligations we've made for ourselves, but whether or not that's of fundamental importance such that you should have to take it in your first year, I don't know. But it's required, so I took it just like everybody else. Um, I'm sitting in the class, in our international law class, and I'm sort of in my assigned seat, I'm in the back. Um, and we were debating that day about whether or not a country should be legally allowed to invade another country if that other country had violated human rights laws or committed genocide or something like that. And one of the students on the far right hand side raised her hand and she said, I think that countries should be allowed to do that. Um, and not only that, but I think that a country like the Netherlands should be allowed to invade Texas if they want to because of their capital punishment laws. <laughs> 
So I, of course, I of course laughed at that because that's hilarious. Um, and I, as I was finishing my laughter, I looked around and I realized that no one else was laughing at that. Um, and that's when I started to realize that I was probably outnumbered at Harvard Law School. That's story number one. Story number two, these get progressively better, I think. Uh, story number two takes place this past spring. As Mark mentioned, I'm president of the Federalist Society at Harvard Law School. And what we did this past spring was to host a conference called the Intellectual Diversity Conference. It got national press and Fox News and USA Today. And so what we did was we invited professors from all over the country to come in and talk about whether or not conservative ideas were being discussed sufficiently at law schools, particularly big elite law schools. Um, and we had professors from around the country there, but we also had professors from Harvard Law who were debating this topic. And one of the professors who was admittedly left of center stood up in front of everyone. He was he's well respected, tenured, published professor, and someone asked him if he if they or if he thought that uh, conservatives were well represented at Harvard Law School and if uh, what they should do if they felt outnumbered. And his suggestion was that conservatives who felt outnumbered at Harvard Law School should probably just move to another school where they would be in the majority. And someone asked him, well, what school would that be? And he said, well, maybe Pepperdine. I don't know if anybody went to Pepperdine. I have nothing but respect for Pepperdine. But I don't have any respect for the idea that all the conservatives should have to go to Pepperdine and the liberals should get all the other schools. Um, so that's story number two. Story number th the first two stories got under my skin when I experienced them firsthand, but story number three probably uh, takes the cake. Story number three was, uh, it took place in my first two weeks at Harvard Law School. I had a good friend who uh, I had just met, and she said, I'm going to go over to another friend's house and watch the Red Sox and the Yankees play on TV. Do you want to come over and, and watch this with this group? So I said, yeah, that sounds great. I'll, I'll come over with you. So we go over to this friend's house, and there are about 15 students there. So and we watch the baseball game, and the game concludes, and we're all chatting after it's over. And one of the older students, a 3L, comes up to me and says, for, for some reason, he had been talking about this earlier, but he said, you know, I just really don't like America very much. And at this point, I kind of, I was out of, out, I was out of the classroom setting, and I would kind of had enough, so I said, yeah, I get that. I mean, it must be really tough to go to the best law school in the world and have virtually limitless professional opportunities after this is over. I would much rather personally be in North Korea, where everyone is absolutely equal. Um, he, didn't, he didn't like that too much, uh, and I was not invited back for any more baseball games. <laughs> those, are, those are three stories to give you an idea, one, of what it's like to be a conservative in a place where you're constantly sort of on the defensive and you're defending your ideas intellectually, which is really not the worst thing in the world. Uh, but it, it also gives you an idea of what it's like to be in a place where you're outnumbered socially and what that can mean for your friend groups and who you interact with and that sort of thing. Um, at this point, you're probably wondering why... Uh, why in the world would you go to a place like Harvard Law School if you had the choice to go? So I, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and what led me there in the first place. Uh, as Mark said, I grew up in Jones County. I grew up in uh, a town called Sandersville. Raise your hand if you've heard of Sandersville. That's a pretty good cross-section. I'm impressed. Sandersville is a town of about 700 people right outside of Laurel. Um, I grew up there. I went to public high school there. I went to Ole Miss uh, and, and started getting involved in political campaigns. Uh, and in conservative causes. I was chair of the College Republicans at Ole Miss. I finished up my time there and decided that I wanted to move to Washington, D.C., so I worked at a think tank there for about a year. And when I was there, I decided that I would apply for the Rhodes Scholarship, which is a scholarship that funds between one and three years of study at the University of Oxford in England. So I was fortunate enough to win that scholarship, and I, I moved to England and I studied there. Uh, I got my master's in economic history there, and at the end of that time, I decided to come back and move to Tupelo, Mississippi, where a guy named Alan Nunley was running against another guy named Travis Childers, who was an incumbent Democratic congressman in the 1st District, and so I served as his policy director for that campaign. Uh, we were fortunate, we won that campaign. At the end of that campaign, um, the Lieutenant Governor, then Lieutenant Governor Phil Bryant called me and said, uh, I don't have a policy director for my last legislative session. Would you be interested in coming and, and serving in that role? So I moved to Jackson and as Mark mentioned, you'll probably remember the 2011 legislative session. We had our normal budget battles that we have every year, but on top of that we had a redistricting battle. Mm -hmm. And as a part of that redistricting battle, we faced a number of votes where if we had lost any of those votes, the 
control of the house of the control of the speaker of the house for the next 10 years probably would have been with a democrat and if we had held our line on any number of those votes then we possibly gave ourselves a chance to win over the speaker of the house for the next 10 years and and that was uh, that worked out in a fortunate way, and so we ended up with uh, Philip Gunn as the Speaker of the House for the next term. During that time when I was working for the Lieutenant Governor and then on his campaign afterwards, I started to think critically about what I wanted to do with my life and why I was in Mississippi and if I wanted to be in public life or private life, and I realized that I really wanted a way to challenge myself. I wanted to see how I stacked up against the smartest kids in the country and I wanted to I wanted to go to a place where I knew that other people with differing ideas about how the world worked would push me and I wanted to see how I stood up to that test. Um, and I was also interested in the law generally and so I decided that I would go to law school. I had applied to a few law schools a couple of years earlier and got into some good ones and I decided that uh, I would defer the choice, so I told them that I would make up my mind in the next year or the year after that. So when the campaign was winding down, I realized that this was my opportunity to either join a gubernatorial administration or join the private sector or either leave for a little while and then hopefully come back to Mississippi after law school. So I, I decided to go to law school. I packed up my bags in August of 2011 and I moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is uh, much colder than it is here. I don't know if you've heard that before. Um, I moved to Cambridge and for the most part I got a lot of what I expected. I was surrounded by a lot of really smart people, uh, both faculty and students. They pushed me in ways that I didn't expect to be pushed. I had to work harder than I'd ever worked before. But at the same time, I sort of got to experience some things that I didn't fully expect. And, and the main thing that I didn't fully expect was just how overwhelmingly outnumbered conservatives and libertarians would be at a place like Harvard Law School. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say that, and what I want to do is give you some context <coughs> for, for the numbers around how outnumbered we are. So there are 109 full-time faculty at Harvard Law School. Anybody want to take a guess as to how many of the 109 professors, full-time professors, self-identify as either conservative, moderate, or libertarian? That's a pretty big tent, too. Three? Three is pretty close. Four. Four is the answer. Uh, we'll give it to somebody back there. This price is right. Really? Right. We've added... names? Mary Ann Glendon is one. Uh, she, was, uh, she was ambassador to the Vatican during the Bush administration. Jack Goldsmith was in the Bush administration. Mm -hmm. A guy named John Manning uh, is, is a great professor, really smart guy. Uh, and a guy named Charles Freed is there as well. Charles Freed was the Solicitor General to uh, President Reagan. They have dinner together every night? They don't. Uh, I don't even know, I probably shouldn't say this on camera, I don't even know if some of them like one another, but they're all great people. Um, so we don't really only have four, for the most part. Um, it's really hard to sort of narrow down and pin down how many professors are of which ideology at, at the best law school. So a few years ago, um, a group did a study of all the political donations that were made by law professors at the 21 best law schools in the country. So they, they teased out all the political donations that happened from 1992 to 2002 by law professors. Anyone want to guess what percentage of those political donations went to Democrats? 99%. That's close. 81%. 81%. Which is still further to the left than almost every other profession in the United States. At Harvard Law, it was even worse. 88% of political donations between 1992 and 2002 went to Democrats. Just 12% went to Republicans. That's, that gives you an indication of what the faculty is like. But we still have the sort of same uh, ratios at the student level, too. So in the class of 2014, 557 students were admitted or, or took a place at Harvard Law School. The class is 557 students big. Of those, 130 joined the Federalist Society upon coming to Harvard Law School. And that was a banner year. That was the biggest class we had ever had. And that's great, 130 is great, but that still means we're outnumbered about four to one. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a tough ratio and it's tough, it's tough when you come to Harvard Law School and you realize that you're always going to be outnumbered in every sort of conversation. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it presents really astounding opportunities, both for you to personally grow and challenge yourself and to understand how other people view the world. Some people have asked me too, I said, yeah, that's great, you know, you're outnumbered. You knew what you were getting yourself into, come on, it's Harvard Law School. 
I mean, you knew it was going to be a place full of people who are probably left of center. Why should we worry about little old you who decided to go up there? And I think, to be honest with you, that's a fair point. For the most part, for a conservative that goes to Harvard Law School, you're going to have to be able to defend your ideas about the world. Mm -hmm. And you'll come out a stronger person. If you don't believe that, listen to Ted Cruz speak at some point. Mm -hmm. Ted Cruz was a Harvard Law graduate. The people that this presents a problem for are folks who don't agree with me, folks who are left of center, because those folks are far less likely to find somebody that will challenge their ideas about the world. And that presents, that presents a broader problem for the country as a whole. You've all heard the Bible verse, Matthew 5, 5, the meek shall inherit the earth. Have we heard this Bible verse? Well, this is the information age, and the geeks shall inherit this earth. I can promise you that much. All the little nerds running around with me at Harvard Law School, those are the people who are going to be the CEOs, the senators. They're going to be the Supreme Court justices. Think about it this way. The current Supreme Court has nine members. Five of those went to one law school, Harvard Law School. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Seven sitting United States senators went to Harvard Law School. Now, Mitt Romney and President Barack Obama didn't have a whole lot in common in 2012, but what did they have in common? They both went to Harvard Law School. You're noticing a pattern here. The point is that when we're outnumbered in places like Harvard Law, it's not just important for the students there right then at that time. It's important for the country 20 and 30 years down the road. And unless we start to change the conversations at places like Harvard Law School, we're going to lose the battle of ideas 20 and 30 years down the road. Mm -hmm. Just imagine for a moment what it would have been like if then student Barack Obama at Harvard Law School in 1990 had had just one more conservative professor, or it had just two or three more conservative friends to really push him on ideas. Mm -hmm. Would he have been a Republican at the end of the day? Absolutely not, of course not. But would it have changed the way he negotiates? Maybe. Maybe it would have slightly changed the way, because the only way you change people's minds is if you catch them at an early age and you expose them to new ideas. After that time, those ideas are set, and you'll never be able to change their mind. They'll be entrenched for the rest of their life. And that's why changing the conversation at Harvard Law School is so important. I realize now that I'm talking for 15 minutes that this is really depressing. So uh, to give you, like, to give you the, the, I guess, the silver lining out of all of this, I told you earlier that 557 students entered in the class of 2014. 130 of those joined the Federalist Society. Not only was that the biggest class that we had ever had of new students who self-identified as conservative, moderate, or libertarian, that was the biggest class of any law school in the entire country. That's something that we were really proud of, not only because, not only because we know it's important for those students specifically, but we know it's important because of Harvard Law's outsized impact on the future of the country 20 and 30 years down the road. If we keep doing stuff like that, if we keep having conferences like the Intellectual Diversity Conference where we pull in speakers and we debate serious ideas about limited government, then we can start to change the conversation. At the end of the day, conservatism really has always been about winning the battle of ideas. We are never going to be able to give out as much goodies as the other side. What we have to win is the battle of ideas. And if we can't win the battle of ideas at Harvard Law School, we're not going to be able to win it in the country. So thank you so much for having me. I'll take you back. Undecideds or people with impressionable minds at Harvard to kind of bring them into the fold and establish a dialogue with them. Uh, you did some conferences. What, what else are you doing for outreach? Like we want to grow the Tea Party. What are you doing to grow your? Right. We we do this. We engage with this at multiple levels. So I talked to you about the big conference, and and that's great because you can have a speaker come in. And we can have speakers from the law school, and they'll come in and debate ideas. We do at least one event like this per week. So we'll, we'll pay for the president of AEI, Arthur Brooks, to come in and talk about the morality behind free market capitalism. And somebody will come in and debate the other side with him. And that's good in the sense that you can have two speakers up here, and they'll debate ideas, and people will come, and it's really low pressure. You come, and you sit, and you listen to these ideas. And we provide free lunch at every, at every event, so law students like free lunch, which is a good thing. The thing is, though, you can't just have that. That needs to be one level of the kind of engagement you get. So we do a couple of other things, too. One, we just do generally social events. 
with other groups on campus, and that can be social events with a group called ACS, the American Constitution Society, which is the liberal counterpart to the Federalist Society. So we'll do social events with them to sort of bridge the gap and talk about, uh, have conversations about policy. One level up from that, we do teas. So tea is really popular in New England. Uh, we do teas with the ACS and other historically liberal groups. And so what we'll do is we'll pick five members from the Federalist Society and then we'll pick five members from this other liberal group and we'll pick a single topic and folks will read about the topic for the week and then over lunch or an afternoon they'll all come together and they'll have a conversation about this topic. And so that's been one way we, uh, I think we view it more as an education campaign for other people who don't necessarily hear our viewpoint that often. Um, but I think everyone views it as just a dialogue campaign in general. And then one level up from that, uh, we have formal debates. And so instead of bringing in speakers from around the country, we will get representatives of student representatives from Federalist Society or college Republicans or the law school Republicans and then historically liberal groups We'll bring everybody together and we'll have a debate. And what we do in the beginning is, for all of the people who are in attendance, we poll them and we say, how many people agree with the proposition? This was one of the propositions we had this year. How many people agree with the proposition that there should be a federal ban on assault weapons? And we'll poll the room. And then we'll have this debate. And two people on the pro side will come up and two people on the con side will come up. And then at the end of the day, we'll have another poll. Uh, and we'll poll the room and we'll say, now that you've heard this debate, how many people agree with this proposition and how many people disagree with this proposition? As it turns out, in that particular debate that we had, when we walked in, there were less than five people who said that, no, there should not be uh, a ban on assault weapons. And by the end of it, it had dramatically grown and we won the debate at the end of the day. So you end up with really good opportunities to talk about issues like that at multiple different levels. And we have, we have a lot of those and really the key trick is just having a lot of free food because we know that 20 something <laughs> students want to come in and eat free pizza or free tea or whatever it is. And it ends up working, I think.